The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Population and economic growth spell a demand for much more energy, states the opening paragraph of RBC's Climate Action Institute report. The Institute is honest in its assessment of the path forward to a net zero economy. The bank's Senior Vice President John Stackhouse says climate pressures spell an imperative for a different mix. Looking forward, global population is forecast to exceed 9 billion people by approximately 2040. So the question is, can that world population power itself into a new age of sustainable growth, states the report. It goes on to ask, can Canada, a global leader in energy, create new technologies, realize new opportunities, and create value in a net zero economy? I invited senior vice president of RBC, John Stackhouse, to join me for a conversation that matters about the highlights of the research the report lays out, the six major conclusions, and the path forward. John, welcome. Great. It's great to be with you, Stuart. So what has been the impetus behind creating RBC's Climate Action Institute? Well, it starts with RBC's own commitment uh, to climate and to a pathway to net zero for ourselves uh, and especially for our clients, most of whom are committed to this and are already working on reducing their emissions. We're trying to help them uh, with that. Our success is uh, measured by something called financed emissions, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're, we're mapping how that can come down in line with the country's uh, direction. We're not going to get to net zero. Our clients won't get to net zero in all likelihood if Canada doesn't. We're all in this together. So with that in mind, we felt <clears throat> it might be helpful to create a research team, uh, which I get to oversee, uh, under our economics and thought leadership team. So just as the bank has an economics research team that studies the economy, does forecasts, help people track inflation and interest rates. We're building this, uh, this research institute to help Canadians understand how we're doing on, uh, on climate action and our progress towards, uh, towards net zero. Is this because, as I noted in one of your uh, entries, um, we can't just put that entire responsibility on the government. Do we as uh, private citizens, but largely also organizations, have a responsibility to be moving in that same direction? I, I, absolutely. This is on all of us. Most of the, uh, the, 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 certainly the financial weight, has come from governments. We just published a report uh, called Double or Trouble, uh, which calculated that about 80% of climate action, as we measure it, uh, investments over the last decade in Canada have come from government, often through subsidies, both industrial and consumer subsidies. That's not sustainable. Uh, we need to see the provinces do more, but we really need to see the private sector and consumers uh, step up. So groundwork has been laid, time now for more private action. Also time, uh, we'd suggest for a bit more emphasis on the demand side. Most of the focus has been on the supply side of the economy, the industrial side of the economy, that's important. But the demand side is also critical and we need to, to have both moving forward. So on that demand side then, is are you saying that it's incumbent upon us as consumers to make sure that what we're doing is we're asking for the kinds of changes in product development, the types of energy that we use and so on, so that we're going to have beneficial impacts. Ab absolutely. And we're seeing change. We're seeing momentum. Uh, our report shows that with electric vehicles, we're now at about 10%. Uh, that's impressive. Not yet at an inflection point, but, but uh, uh, you can see that on the horizon. Heat pumps, fascinating, ha overtook gas furnace sales last year for the first time in Canada, but also globally. So there is change afoot. Uh, as I say, it's not yet at that classic inflection point that economists see uh, sort of momentum carries itself uh, in the market. We've seen that with smartphones as, a, as an example, but we're getting fairly, uh, fairly close. We also uh, surveyed uh, uh, Canadians to better understand attitudes on, on climate, and most don't want to do something that uh, hurts their standard of living. That's understandable. Uh, but most Canadians want to do something and they want more information uh, and they want to understand the choices that they're making. So there's a need out there, even a hunger for what we call climate literacy mm -hmm. uh, from uh, people of all, 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 all kinds right across the country 
wanting to understand the choices that they can make, the pros and cons uh, through their daily activities. There's a fascinating book out uh, that was put out by the Trilateral Commission called The New Spirit of uh, Capitalism. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but in it, uh, the authors talk about the concept of allowing markets to really be the driving force that's going to help us address climate change. They, and they said, and what we need to do is to, in, in this new spirit of capitalism, is make sure that we have a regulat regulatory framework that that will be consistent, so that the market and innovators can then bring the energy and resources that they have to that solution. How important is it for us to have that kind of, um, you know, solid, consistent framework that that organizations go, okay, I can trust that this is going to be here. I'm now pouring my energy and resources into that. There, there is a great need for policy consistency. And a lot of what we're seeing right now in the world is policy uncertainty. And investors are holding up, corporates are holding up saying, we don't know if uh, governments might even be the same government right. are going to tear things uh, up. We've already seen that in this country. We've seen it in, uh, in, in other countries as well. It takes a, 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 a delicate hand because the climate transition is a transition. Uh, there's a cliche that it's a, it's a dial, not a switch. A lot of people just want to flip a switch and everything will be fine. The world doesn't work that way. Energy systems don't work that way. But dials are very powerful and you need to keep turning the dial uh, on markets, uh, tightening up uh, things, loosening up other, other, other things. And having that consistent framework, uh, policy framework th through time with an appreciation that sometimes you need to make adjustments. Because the world changes. You can have a Russian invasion of Ukraine and suddenly uh, markets go this way. Uh, mm -hmm. You can have other shocks in, uh, in the system. So we've seen through economic history that governments always need to maintain that flexibility to be used rarely when there are those shocks uh, or, and certainly major unexpected events in the, uh, in the economy. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Mark Jacquard, who heads up uh, the BC Utilities uh, Commission here, argues that if we try and go around passing new laws as a way of dealing with this, we're going to get so caught up in the politicization of it. He, he actually argues that we're much better off just going around and uh, refining regulations in a myriad of different ways around manufacturing, uh, around approval, and so on. Where, are you, where do you lean on that? We need to lean on innovation uh, and the power of technology. Yes, we need regulation and uh, uh, stronger regulations in, 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 in some areas. But as you say, I mean, the, the, the force of markets through, uh, through history, but we see that uh, year in and year out in this country, is the most powerful force for change. So let's uh, embrace that force. Let markets do what markets do uh, very well, have guardrails around them so that there isn't harm done but allow for that innovation, for that risk-taking. We're not seeing enough risk-taking right now in, in climate across a range of industries. We need to ensure that entrepreneurs, investors, uh, venture capital uh, investors particularly, see the opportunity to take chances, to have governments kind of stand out of their way, to fail uh, and uh, suffer the consequences of that, but to profit if they succeed and profit very, very well. And that will draw in more innovation and uh, uh, the creative juices of, of our, our society will, will flourish. You talked a, a few moments ago about, you know, most Canadians uh, really are committed to the idea that we want to be moving towards net zero. But at what cost? And one of the things that I appreciate about the report is you indicate, yeah, it's going to take a lot of money. Um, billions and billions, if not trillions, to get where, uh, to where we want to go to. But I found it interesting that you went, on the surface you say, that's an extraordinary amount of money. But when you r realize what percentage of GDP it is, it's not so significant. How do we get away from the idea of like, oh my gosh, look at how expensive it is, to let's keep it in perspective and continue to move forward. We, we, we did a major report a couple of years ago called the $2 trillion transition. And that was our economics team's estimation of how much capital Canada will need over 25 years 
to get to net zero, $2 trillion. That sounds like a fantastical number. And yes, it is. Yeah. But you break it down, <coughs> excuse me, mm. that's 60 billion roughly with inflation uh, a year. It works out to about two to 3% of, of GDP, very significant, but not uh, beyond our, our, our reach. It's critical that we also understand, not only is this not beyond our reach, but this is largely investment capital. This is not tax and spend. And we have to think a bit more mm. like a, as a business, as a country, to think, how are we going to raise, like an entrepreneur would say, $60 billion a year from global capital markets, from Canadian capital markets, raise that money and then invest it in this economic transformation. We as a country have a growth problem. We have been in a slow growth uh, zone for mm -hmm. a number of, of years. The, the pandemic was, uh, was a disruption to that, but we're now sliding back into that slow growth uh, uh, phase. And one of the underlying challenges of that slow growth phase is that business investment in this country is dropping. It is down 16, one six percent over the last decade. Right. And <coughs> it's dropped significantly for uh, machinery and equipment and intellectual property, the things that our economy thrives on. So how do we think of ways to bring in business investment, not government investment, business investment into the machinery and equipment and the IP, the brain powers that is going to transform all of our sectors, it can be the electricity sector, the oil and gas sector, the building sector, the transportation sector, and raise growth rates for the next quarter century. We're getting older as a society. That makes growth even more challenging. We save less as, uh, as, we, as, we, uh, as we age. We take less chances with our investments. So we see this, the climate transformation, or, uh, we see the climate challenge as an opportunity for economic transformation and uh, a, a growth opportunity for the, uh, for the country. We need to do it for the climate imperative, first and foremost, but we also need to see this as an economic opportunity. As you speak, I can't help but think that you're, in some ways you're saying, uh, this is a new kind of infrastructure uh, investment. Is that, is that the, what you envision this being in some ways? If we look at it from that perspective, and when you invest in infrastructure, you're investing in the long term. Some of it is infrastructure. We need a lot more infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, as an example. But a lot of this is also, and it's important to differentiate, a lot of this is private capital. This is classic risk-taking, building a hydrogen plant, uh, building uh, a, a, an EV charging network. That's a bit, bit of an infrastructure, one might, uh, one might argue, but developing new EV models, taking chances on those, trying to revolutionize the way we make buses and trains. We need entrepreneurs to take the chances on those. Some will fail, some will succeed, uh, and we'll end up with products, be they cars, trains, airplanes, uh, that are very different from uh, what we have today, but we'll have lots of economic benefits that go with that. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So in your report, you start off by saying, okay, in the next 25 years, we're going to need basically another United States worth of power to be able to power the world through. How do we get there knowing that the mix that we need to have is going to be quite a bit different than the current one that we have? Mix is a critical word in energy systems. We often don't understand because we get to take it for granted that all of our energy, the heat, the lights that, uh, that uh, allow us to live the lives that we enjoy, often come from multiple energy sources. There are interdependencies of, uh, of those sources. We have complex systems for energy. So back to the point about a transition, a, a dial, not a, not, a, not, not a switch. We need to continue to transition those energy systems and not do anything radical that will break uh, the interdependencies uh, and put parts of society, communities, uh, uh, and, and, and larger shares of the population more vulnerable, at risk of uh, energy uh, in, insecurity. Energy systems are different in, in different parts of the world. They're different in different parts of the country. Right. So let's not assume that what works in BC is going to work in Saskatchewan or southern Ontario. Part of our challenge in this climate journey is allowing for regional flexibility. 
and we need yeah. you know, national standards, national frameworks. It's a beautiful part of our country yeah. is its diversity. Yeah. And that includes the diversity of economies and energy systems. So allowing for different parts of the country to develop their own energy systems, continue to develop their own energy systems with kind of emissions goals in mind will, we think, allow for more creativity uh, in different parts of the country. Um, sort of your next point is about the role of renewables, and you think it'll play about a 20% role. And, uh, you know, I'm, in some ways I'm fascinated by these uh, vanadium redux batteries because of their ability, quick ability to recharge and the, the scale that they get. But I'm, I'm also really interested in the, the use of renewable power to create green hydrogen. Because what I like about green hydrogen is you can then store it in a canister and there's no leakage like the way that it would be in a battery. And the great thing, especially when we're in transition, is that green hydrogen blends beautifully with uh, gasoline, diesel, and natural gas. And just by, by virtue of the fact that you're blending with it, uh, blending that fuel in, you're reducing the carbon footprint of any uh, internal combustion engine. The idea of blending is, is fascinating, isn't it? Because we're yeah. going to have, in, in, in lots of our energy supply, including our fuels, a different mix, a different blend as we go. So it may look the same yeah. uh, to us, but the contents are going to be changing year by year, decade by decade. Again, part of that, that dial rather than the, the switch. Green hydrogen is one of the most fascinating uh, parts of this uh, transition. We did, I, I get to host a, a podcast called Disruptors. Uh, and we had an episode on green hydrogen uh, a couple of weeks ago. There is kind of a space race underway globally. And Canada can be uh, at, the, at the front of the pack in this race, but we've got to continue to, uh, to, to pick it up. I was fascinated in getting to go to the climate uh, conference in Dubai, COP28, yeah. to see and hear about the, 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 the ambitions, but the real activities of other countries on green hydrogen. So the Saudis and the Chinese have formed a, an incredible alliance on green hydrogen, and they'll have the capital and the technology yeah. to scale this very quickly and to incent, i.e. to subsidize, other countries to adopt their technologies, be it in Asia or Africa or elsewhere. That may be a good thing. Uh, and competition is a very good thing. So competing with that, the state of Texas, great oil state, mm -hmm. has ambitions to be a green hydrogen power. Yeah. and uh, may even turn America into uh, an even greater energy exporter through green hydrogen because they have the, 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 the sun and the, uh, uh, the wind. Canada has terrific wind assets. Yes. Uh, we lay out in our report how wind, it's interesting to see the, gr the growth of wind in the country, but we think wind is kind of the, the opportunity for Canada, especially on our two coasts, not near industrial centers, right, on the two coasts, but you can create green hydrogen out of that and then export it across to uh, two great oceans. Yeah, and you don't have to build an, an, an electrical grid to deliver that wind power down to the lower mainland, let's say from northern BC. You can have it in canisters and you can ship it down or put it on uh, roads, or you can uh, push it through pipelines that already exist. Like, it's such a, a perfect mix. I don't know if you know about this guy, Walter Merida, out at UBC. Uh, are you familiar yes, yeah, great, with the uh, great thinker? You know, here he says, in our parking lot, you come in in the morning with your electric vehicle. Only electric vehicles are allowed to park here. And we'll actually pay you to park here uh, because we're going to take the, ba the power from your battery and we're going to use it to s start up the grid in the morning. But through the day, we're going to be creating other energy. We're going to repower your car so you can go home. But we're going to use that other energy to create green hydrogen. And, and that when you think about uh, delivery vehicles and commercial vehicles and whatnot, looks to me like it is a more sustainable way in which we're able to, to move to a lower carbon footprint for so many of those kinds of vehicles. It's, that's the kind of innovative thinking yeah. that we need a lot of. There, there are paradigm shifts happening left, right, and, uh, and, and center. Uh, if, if, if you look at the warehouse industry as an, as, as an example, every warehouse owner uh, who I get to talk to is exploring ways of putting solar panels on the roofs of, uh, of warehouses, not to power the warehouses, to power the trucks yeah. that drive in. So if you're a commercial fleet, you can just drive into the Amazon warehouse, yep. mm -hmm. unload your, uh, or, or pick up your, 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 your products, but also pick up a charge 
and away you go, uh, thanks to those solar right. panels on the roof. Same with neighborhoods, a lot of anxiety about, you know, my street's going to blow up if everyone charges their car at the same time. It's not going to happen because most of us charge cars overnight when the rest of the house is not using uh, electricity. But we can also be drawing power from the car for, uh, to store in, uh, for, 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 for household use. So again, right. interesting little paradigm shifts that the entrepreneurs out there see as, of course, you've got to take risks and things will go sideways. But that's the beauty of, of entrepreneurship. They see these p paradigm shifts as the opportunity to create new business models and develop new economic models. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Point number three in your report suggests that peak oil demand is nearing. Um, and it, it looks like we are definitely moving in that direction, despite the fact that there are so many global economies that are still growing and, and require energy. Um, how confident are you that, that we're going to peak out on our demand side? It, it, it's going to peak, but uh, as our report says, not as soon as some are, are, are saying. We see uh, no peak before 2035. Yeah. As, as an example. So others say, you know, credible organizations say, no, it's going to be the late uh, 2020. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's see. Uh, in the grand scheme of history, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, yeah. like the, the trajectory is that it will, 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 uh, will, will, will peak sometime in the foreseeable future and then start to decline. One of the critical points in the oil debate that is often overlooked because people you know, get so worked up about trying to have a, an exact peak date. In some ways, the peak date doesn't matter. It's the decline rate mm -hmm. after the peak. Right. You can have a little peak and then it flatlines and nothing has really, uh, really changed. In fact, we may be higher than where we are today, but lower than a peak. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of an artificial peak, right. if you will. The big question is, is there going to be a significant deceleration of, uh, of demand through the 2030s and 2040s? We'll see. The, one of the key factors is going to be the affordability and scalability of alternatives, right. renewables, as you've been saying. So if we, if we have success in green hydrogen, for example, it's an if, but we'll know in the, uh, you know, certainly this decade, mm -hmm. whether green, green hydrogen can be scaled for mass consumption, then that will certainly lead to that, uh, that uh, sharp drop of uh, oil demand. If it's interesting, novel, but isn't going to scale to be a, uh, to, to fill the mass needs, let's say, of an India, uh, then we'll still have significant oil demand below peak, but significant uh, through, uh, through the 2030s. Okay, so enter LNG, um, because long touted here, especially in British Columbia, as being this uh, cleaner alternative that can displace the role of coal, which is probably the dirtiest form of uh, carbon uh, emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and so you go, okay, LNG. But we still know, you know, the chemical composition of natural gas is CH4. It's still one carbon molecule for every unit that you burn. Yep. Uh, so you're still putting carbon into the atmosphere. What do you see as the future for LNG? It's an important transition fuel. Mm -hmm. It's an important part of the, uh, the mix and it's an important export opportunity for the country. There are very good abatement technologies, and those will get better uh, for LNG uh, production and shipping. Uh, so scopes one and two, as they're known, uh, are going to be largely contained, at least for the LNG plants of, uh, of the future. Scope three, the use of it uh, at the end state, uh, is uh, the subject of much debate. Is that enough of a concern to stop us? say, from shipping LNG or shipping more LNG to, uh, to other countries. Critically, do we know that other countries will be turning off those coal plants, as an example, because of the LNG shipments? Or will they forego the opportunity to invest in renewables? That would be a, an unintended consequence that, right. that no one wants. So as a country, we need to work out good systems to understand and verify where our LNG is going, probably mm -hmm. not down to the molecule, but certainly uh, at, uh, at, a, at a significant quantum to understand what emissions reduction is resulting from, uh, from, from our production. Second point we need to be very mindful of is what's gone on in the United States. 
So over the last decade, the U.S. has become an LNG superpower. It's just yeah. it's mind-boggling. I was down in New Orleans uh, uh, in the Delta area a year ago, and it is jaw-dropping just to see the industrial complexes that have emerged in one, uh, in one decade. And the U.S. is quite determined, despite the, the Biden moratorium during an election year, uh, to be an, uh, leading, the leading LNG exporter to, to the world. It'll be interesting to see in the coming years, and by coming years, I mean the next kind of two to three years, how demand responds to that. There's going yeah. to be a lot more LNG on the open seas, including from Canada, uh, into the late 20, uh, 20s. Is that going to lead to more take up, uh, more demand as you put more supply into the market, or a glut that will lead to lower prices and uh, undermine some of the investments that's gone in? Beauty of a market economy, <laughs> if, it, if we could predict that with certainty, there'd be no <laughs> risk. If no risk, there'd be no re reward. Yeah. Uh, but it's something that Canadians need to keep a close eye on. There's still a couple more points in your, uh, your report that uh, viewers can go and, and view, but we're out of time here. Uh, this is fascinating, and it's the kind of discussions that we have to be having more of so that we are motivating as many people as possible to be thinking about what can we individually do, what can we do as companies, and also what do we do as governments. Thanks so much for your time today. Stuart, thanks for your interest. I appreciate it. Great conversation.